I'd like you to, to pause for a moment and think about this room. We have this big, elegant auditorium, and the architect designed big, elegant windows. And then they put blinders on the windows so as to prevent them from being useful. And then we turned on lights so that we could see. And this is essentially the, the nature of the world we live in. One of our sponsors is Pepsi, but we have a speaker talking about how awful carbonated sugar water is to drink. <laughs> Right? It's the nature of life, right? So I'm a, kind of jazzed up. I'm excited to be here. I heard about a famous television or, or radio pronouncer who used to drink a lot of water before his speech, and he did that so that when he got on the radio, he was really jazzed up. And I'm kind of in a state right now, so I'm a little bit excitable. And I don't have a lot of time. I'm already used up a minute. So I want to do a bunch of things today, but we'll just start by talking a little bit about the curiosity of life. And curiosity has two meanings. There's curiosity as in that innate feeling of I want to know more about something, and there's curiosity as in that is a curious house. In other words, that is a house that makes one curious to learn a little more about it, right? So this is where we're going, and I want to tell you a story from my teenage years. I spent my freshman year of high school in Egypt, fairly well unsupervised. I had a roommate who was a year younger than me, and it didn't go quite the way we planned, but we learned a lot about the world. And at one point, at two in the morning, we were in Cairo, in the area called New Cairo, or Masagadid in Arabic, and we went to the tram to go home, and the tram had stopped running because it was two in the morning. And despite that it was Ramadan and Egypt, and people stay up late and sleep all day that time of the year, there was still no tram. So we walked for several hours to get back to where we needed to go. And as only a white American 14-year-old male full of hubris would think, I said, damn, if I can make it here, if I can find my way home in Egypt, you could drop me anywhere in the world and I could make it. This sort of confidence of understanding how the world worked and what you could do with it really got me to think, and okay, what does that mean? Does that mean I really could? Could you drop me in Brazil? And could I make it? Could you drop me in Antarctica? And when you're young, you think, of course, I'm awesome. I'm like a super boy scout. I grew up on a commune. I know about fires and knives and sticks and so on. And when you get older, you start to realize it's a little more complicated than that, right? So I want you all to close your eyes, right? This is the interactive part of it. Close your eyes and imagine yourself naked in a trash bag, okay? No, don't open your eyes, right? You gotta really imagine. And I was gonna come out here naked in a trash bag. I thought about it, no, seriously. And I was like, you know, it's just gonna be awkward, like I'm gonna put on my boxers and there's gonna be this weird moment of like, is this appropriate and who knows what, right? <laughs> And uh, you know, what if the bag got stuck and in my zipper and so on, because I, you know, so the trash bag is just a, my gift to you so that you're not naked, right? So you can picture yourself naked in a trash bag and I want you to picture a map and just to be nice, again, to be nice, you're in the United States, I want you to picture a map of the United States and you throw a dart at the map, right? Foomp! And I want you to picture the city where it landed and on the count of three, I want you to yell out that city. One, two, three, yell. Okay, and just to be nice, it's March, it's not December, okay? Because I don't want you to be freezing naked in a trash bag because things get really bad really quickly when you're cold and wet in a trash bag. You don't have shoes on, right? Hopefully most of you picked like a city, right? Some of you might have picked a cornfield, in which case you're, you're screwed, right? Because unless you know how to like make a hut out of corn stalks and start producing food and so on and so forth. So, I want you now, you can open your eyes and I want you to think about this situation. Actually, you know, you should keep them closed because it'll help you know, distract you from all this other stuff. What do you need at that moment? What is the most important thing at that moment? Yell it out. I didn't understand any of that, but that's okay. So typically we all go through this, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You've all seen the pyramid, right? First thing is like, water, food, shelter, and then you get into things like companionship, purpose of life, good sex, things like that, right? You're lucky if you get this stuff on the bottom. We all need stuff, but it does neglect some other things that we'll get into in a minute, right? So water, let's assume for now in most of the United States you can find water if you need it, enough to keep you hydrated. Maybe half a gallon, a couple liters a day, right? What's your next priority? We can all go, most of us could go a couple days without food, right, as long as we have water. So what's next? What do we have to get? Air, okay, so let's take air for granted because we don't have to pay for it. That actually allows us to take it for granted. I'm thinking shoes would be cool. Unless you will do a lot of barefoot walking, you need calluses. So um, we don't have time to go through this exercise proper. I think it would actually be a fantastic exercise, especially to do with kids. Because kids take for granted, like they've never, many of them have never had to use an outhouse or go to the bathroom in something other than 
a public restroom or a, a home restroom, right? Unless they're into Boy Scouts or camping or what have you. Many of you, we have a generation that's shifting now where kids have never really seen the reality of the world, where animals come from, where tomatoes come from, where, you know, poop goes, right? It sounds kind of crude, but why not take people on a sanitation tour? Because it's pretty important. This is, nobody understands the importance of a toilet till they don't have one. And then suddenly it becomes really, really significant, right? So there's all this stuff going on. So I want you to picture the steps that you have to go through, having thrown the dart at the map to get yourself established. Now, what does that mean, established? When you say to somebody, I'd like to marry your daughter, or I'd like to marry your son, and they examine you as a person, what do they want to see? They want to see income potential. They want to see good health. They want to see the ability to defend and stand up for and educate children and bear children and all those other things, right? The things that you look for in your sons and daughters. You want that partner to come home and say, Vazang, let's get them married. I'm happy that they're together, right? What would it take for you, naked and trash bag, to go from that point to the point where you're comfortable approaching somebody's parents saying, I'd like to marry your son or daughter, right? And bonus points, you can't lie or cheat or steal. You can't take charity, and you have no documentation. That means your fancy degree, and your driver's license, and your birth certificate, they're gone. Oh my God, now it starts to get complicated. Because no matter how educated you are, what's gonna happen when you go into the 7-Eleven and say, hey, can I just work here for a day to make enough money to go buy some shoes? Do you have a work permit? Right? I can hire you working barefoot. Oh, you need, you need tools to do that job. All of us are living on the shoulders of people who helped us before. And what kids don't understand, and what a lot of adults don't come understand, and what especially white men don't understand, is it all came. It's all the privilege you came with and you grew up with. Right? So how do we, why does this matter? It matters because what we want is for everybody to understand all of these things so that everybody could go into that environment naked in a trash bag and become successful quickly. What does that involve? Well, it's about that hard, right? If any of you work with minorities, if any of you work trying to get girls into STEM, if any of you teach kids with learning disorders or from broken families or from poverty or with illnesses, you know it's like this, right? What we want is for people to have savvy. Savvy and grit. What does that mean? That means you know how to talk to people. That means you know how to work hard and sweat if you need to. That means you have integrity, and when you say things, you live up to what you say. That means learning things that you should have learned in kindergarten from your parents' example, but you maybe didn't. It also means learning just the basics of how the world works. That household electric current is 110 alternating current, and battery is different DC direct current. That your car battery functions very differently from the outlet coming out of your wall. And that if you're cold and homeless, one of the best ways to stay warm is to crumple newspaper and put it in your pants to create an insulation barrier. Now this is all over the place, but it's all relevant. How do we live in the world? Where do we get the water from and where does it go when we're done with it? How do we interact with humans? And on and on and on. So having something, I have a toilet, I have a water fountain, is very different from knowing about it, which is also very different from understanding how it got there and why you have it and somebody else doesn't. So what do you need to live? Very basic. This is typical American week of consumption, kind of back to what Anthony was talking about. Not exactly the most healthy way to live. Certainly puts off an awful lot of waste. We were talking about this in the car. We stop by the coffee shop, we have three paper cups. Is that necessary? Does everybody need to go through a paper cup every single day of their life? And then this is a third world country. Notice it's a lot of less prepared foods with reusable packaging. Um, more healthy, less healthy. But what do we really need to live? That's just, that's later on. Which is more important, electricity or your heart? Your heart, would you all agree that your heart is more important than having electricity? Okay, which one is more important? The electricity that runs your heart or wind power? So you have to all learn the consulting answer. Anytime someone asks, you a, que answers, asks a question like that, especially rhetorical questions, the answer is, it depends. Right? So I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to say, it depends. Which one is more important? It depends. Okay, are we talking about the electrical impulses that run your circulatory system, or are we talking about having a light switch? 
because you die without the electrical impulses that run your body, okay? So electricity is more important than anything else, and after that, it's your blood, and after that, it's the oxygen, and after that, we can get into more advanced things like water, right? Oh, but you know what? If you don't have water, your blood won't work. So it's all tied together, and that's the problem. How many of you know what STEM is? Raise your hand. You've all, we're all sick of STEM, right? And then we talk about STEAM. Let's, have, let's let the arts take over STEM again, and on and on and on. It all goes together. My partner is a biologist, and I was asking her, so does electricity make the muscles move? And she says, well, there's a chemical that re releases, which then causes the electrical impulse. So chemistry and physics go together. They're not separate disciplines, but we separate them. Okay, so I want to go back. Last year, I talked about the EcoBox, the shipping container. We had a mission to create a shipping container for two people. We did all these floor plans. We talked about composting toilets and ties right into the aquaponics, and solar panels and power and so on. We did two prototypes. We have a 40-footer and a 20-footer, and they're both in Charlotte, and we're still working on those. And then we had a mission. We created a nonprofit to advocate sustainable building and teach sustainability. But then we got into other things. And so this is the evolution of sort of my personal mission and a number of the people I hang out with. So it's not just me. So when I speak, say we, I'm not speaking the royal we. I'm speaking about the crew, if you will. It's a bunch of different people, and they're all over the world. People in hackerspaces and makerspaces and educators and science museums and so on. So we went from the shipping container project to the final mission, help people demystify the world around them. Because I truly believe that as you begin to understand the world around you, you can do something about it. If you don't understand the world, you're stuck. You have what we call learned helplessness. <clears throat> and all of you have a little bit of that. All of you have learned that when certain things happen, you can make a phone call or call a help desk or push a button and someone else will take care of the problem, right? I don't know how to fix my Android phone. I can't take this apart and start soldering chips. I go to the Sprint store. I have a warranty from Best Buy, right? I've learned to be helpless when it comes to my phone. It doesn't work, I don't know, reboot it, reformat it, right? Because the world gets more and more complicated, so we become more and more specialized. But when it comes to food and water and fish, and where we sleep, and the bathrooms we use, we ought to know how it works, right? So this is a picture I took from the lab at my community college, and you get, kind of get the gist of what they're saying here, right? No, nothing, can't do anything, children are evil, and who knows what else, right? Lots and lots of problems. By the way, this is dry ice, and they say you shouldn't mess with it. And if you go to the science museum, some of you have glasses and rubber gloves and so on, but dry ice is fun, and you get it at Harris Teeter for 10 cents a pound. So we have about eight pounds or nine pounds there at the table for lunch, and you can put it in your drinks and uh, have some fun with it. So yeah, it'll burn you if you hold on to it for a minute, but so will the stove at home. So what is, Dana? yeah, if you swallow a piece of dry ice, it'll keep expanding as the CO2 turns to gas in your stomach and you probably burp or fart or both, or in worst case scenario, rupture your stomach. So don't swallow it. Just like you wouldn't swallow a piece of burning wood, okay? So here we go. We can get near the campfire without necessarily eating the campfire, right? So I can see some safety expert who works at a science museum is out there, oh, the liability here, right? At some point, we gotta let go of it. I wanna have a club where all the parents sign, say, I will never, ever, ever sue you for anything, just teach my kid good stuff, right? And we'll sign on. And if you're not interested in that, then don't send your children to me. So there's a bunch of stuff going on here. I say yes, what is that? What is, but well, what's interesting about that banana? Did we cut a part off? We put the banana in liquid nitrogen, and then a kid hit it with a hammer, right? So it's got a chunk broken out because it's frozen solid. So that's the kind of things we like to do with kids. Let's play. There's nothing like putting Cheetos in liquid nitrogen and then eating it. Because you, you, you steam out nitrogen from your nose. You're like, oh my God, nitrogen. How many of you think nitrogen is poisonous? No, you know nitrogen they make bombs out of, right? It's a big deal. Nitrogen is all about making explosives. Guess what? It's like 90% of the air we breathe. How many kids really know that? We think we're breathing oxygen. Oxygen is a tiny portion of it. Carbon dioxide, which is greenhouse gas, is even less than that. So nobody understands this. So we do a lot of things. Started with Charlotte Hackerspace. We did camps at school. Notice the little flying fish in the background. We had the remote controlled radio stuff. We got girls and kids soldering. This is what we look like when we go to a camp. It's like mad scientists. We're trying to kind of solidify that and organize it. You put LEDs on CDs. So we had a little example. I don't know if you can hear this. Listen. That's kind of cool, right? Drink. It's like you want to start singing witches brew and things like that. So here. 
You find these batteries, you go to Radio Shack, they're $2.50. You go on eBay and you give a three month lead time, they're a nickel each. You can buy hundreds of them and give them to people. I want to get hundreds for you, but I didn't have the lead time. You take a battery, you take an LED, you start asking kids which one's positive, which one's negative, why does that matter? You get a little flashlight, you put a little, a little thing to keep it apart and you have it turn on and off. And if it's on, it'll last for two days. If it's on and off, it'll last for years. And you've got a little flashlight, emergency flashlight you can keep in your car or what have you. You can do things like attach. It's a little bright in here, but one of our volunteers did this before. We can attach an LED, do a, a release, just like that picture you see, and you get colors. And you have blinky LEDs, and all of this is just pennies and pennies and pennies. There's so much, it's really quite astonishing. You take a popsicle, you send it down, you make a propeller, you attach a battery and LED to you spin it, it flies through the air and makes pretty colors, looks a little bit like that. So we do this camp called Elemental, Earth, Wind, Water, Fire. What is Earth? Earth has to do with electricity, conductivity, positive, negative. We get into air, we have uh, hovercraft there, we have air rockets, which you'll see and some of you have already started building. Air runs pneumatics and, and all kinds of power systems, so air is powerful when harnessed correctly. And that's Daniel, you see, he'll be helping you at lunch. Then we have a hero motor, one of the first steam motors ever made. You, have pre you heat up the water, it creates steam, it shoots jets, makes the little thing spin. And then we have, when you burn wood, you get smoke, and that smoke is actually not smoke, that smoke is unburnt fuel. And if you add hot air to that unburnt fuel, you get another burn, which is wood gas, and the offshoot of that is not smoke or pollution, but H2O, so you get a really clean burn. We have a couple stoves there, unfortunately the situation doesn't allow us to demonstrate them, but they're really remarkable for any of you who worked with wood burning. Tools are critical. You wanna show kids tools, boys and girls alike. Give your girls tools. Give them sets of tools and have them help you with a faucet and have them help you with a doorknob and have them help you with your car. Pay them if you need to. It will stick with them forever and I can tell you from personal experience, I have a daughter in engineering, I have two daughters on robotics teams, they know all about every kind of tool, they've helped me fix my cars, it will serve them well the rest of their lives. These are girls on the robotics team, they've done very well. This is a tech museum exhibit we have. The cool thing about this is you have big hard drive disks, you have, you have small floppies, you have thumb drives, you have circuits, and no matter how old the people coming to the table are, whether they're seven-year-old kids or they're seven-year-old guys, there's always something like, I remember when we used those. And I thought this was a boring exhibit. I set it up, people nonstop all day talking about everything. And 3D printers are changing everything. We've got some great examples there. Thank you very much. Come build a rocket at lunch, and thank you for listening to me. Have a great day.